You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Before we get into today's episode, here's a sneak peek at the audio version of my new book, Love Matters More, How Fighting to Be Right Keeps Us from Loving Like Jesus. If this is interesting, you want to hear more, you want to read more, I would encourage you to go to lovemattersmorebook.com or wherever you order your books and order a copy of Love Matters More. If that's not your cup of tea, you can fast forward this part and get into this amazing episode with James Kugel. Thanks everyone for your support. Chapter 3. Beware of falling in love with cows. One night when I was 17, I came home from a night out with friends and went straight to the kitchen to grab a bite to eat. Even though our kitchen was small, it was where we had our washer and dryer and dining table that sat in front of a large window. As I walked into the kitchen from the living room, I could see my mom sitting there, working on something. We began talking about the night, which somehow led to a conversation about Christianity. Well, to be honest, I tried to steer most of my conversations into conversations about Christianity. We were debating the idea of predestination, whether God chooses which people will go to heaven or whether we have free will. I had recently been introduced to theology, and after reading two or three books on the topic, I was clearly an expert and needed to change everyone's mind to save them from their ignorant ways. Aha, but you see, I said to my mom as I pointed a finger in her face, you've just contradicted yourself. In an instant, she had grabbed my throat with one hand and my shirt with the other and slammed me into our back door. Our eyes grew wide as the realization of what just happened sank in. We both began to shake, and tears streamed down our faces as we sat in silence. Finally, my mom apologized as she explained that people pointing fingers at her was a trigger for when she was a girl, and her father would name-call the children while pointing his finger at them. That's the night I learned that getting theology right wasn't all there was to Christian faith. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the podcast. Today, we're talking about challenging our assumptions about the Bible with Dr. James Kugel. Yeah. uh, Jim is an emeritus professor, which is a nice, fancy way of saying he doesn't work anymore. Now, he's a scholar. He was always working, but he doesn't teach. But he taught for many years at Harvard University. He was actually my doctoral advisor and also um, for many years now at Bar Ilan University in in Israel. So, he's been around a little bit. And... uh, yeah, I mean, this is, to me, this is just so reminiscent for me, such a reminiscence, I guess that's the right word, of, you know, talking to my doctor advisor. But his big thing is ancient interpretation. And that sounds like a really ugh, topic, but oh no, <laughs> it's very relevant. And, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, Jared, but it's, it's basically, you have to keep remembering the New Testament for Christians is a piece of ancient Jewish literature. And there were certain ways of approaching their scripture that are not remotely modern ways of doing it. And that's, I found that's like the biggest hurdle for Christians who want to engage the Bible seriously. That's a big hurdle, I should say, to get over. Um, and it's it's not easy to do. And it's one that you can get into trouble with uh, about when you talk about it too much. Well, that's, yeah, we get into, you get into trouble because it's not only, I wouldn't say it's just relevant for today. I think it's probably one of the most relevant questions facing us mm-hmm. as Christians is what do we, what do we, like when we talk about what do we do with the Bible, you know, what is it? Mm-hmm. These questions are one of the first order questions that come up. Right. Well, but how did they, how did Paul yeah. deal with the Bible? Right. How did Jesus deal with the Bible? Right. What did ancient people do with it? And what if it's not compatible with what we think we should be doing with it now? Right. How do we bridge all that? It makes us examine our own assumptions by looking at the assumptions other people were making and how compatible or incompatible our assumptions might be with ancient assumptions. And and I think one thing I want to just point out here because it, it, you know, we talked about it, but I think this is so important to, you know, encapsulate what we talked about is that how the reason the Bible survived at all is because people got creative quick with the Bible because the Bible itself is written in a time for particular purposes, but as centuries go on, how do you connect with this text, right? You have to, I mean, update its meanings, I guess, as one way. We, we didn't use that language in the interview, but that that's, and there were assumptions that ancient interpreters made, and we'll get into that in the, in the episode itself, but there were assumptions that they made, not consciously, like, let's make these assumptions, but it just religiously driven assumptions about the text that allowed them to, 
bring this ancient text into a very different context. And that's so anathema, isn't it, Jared, to what we were taught, what I was taught in graduate school, what I was taught in seminary. You don't do that. Mm -hmm. You just sort of read the text and it tells you what to do. All right. If well, only. <laughs> well, let's get with this conversation yeah. here with, uh, with James. Uh, Christians for centuries believe that Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac on an altar, uh, because that's what God had demanded, that this was actually a kind of foreshadowing, foretelling of the story of the crucifixion, which God was willing to sacrifice his only son. Well, Jim, welcome to the podcast. Well, good to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here, even though you're here is not here. I, it's a fiction of <laughs> it's a interviewing fiction. anybody. <laughs> you're quite far away, aren't you, right now? I uh, think you're, I'm you're, in Jerusalem. Yes, yeah, so you're in Jerusalem, I know. So, the, And we're not. We're in Souderton, Pennsylvania, uh -huh. which is also an important city, I think. So anyway, no, nothing's happening here. So, Well, listen, it's, it's great to have you here. And, you know, our, our topic today is to talk about ancient interpreters of the Bible, which sounds like maybe for some people an obscure sort of topic, but uh, nothing could be further from the truth. And I know myself, you know, studying under you and learning about these assumptions and sort of seeing them at work was just a really important thing for me for thinking about, you know, frankly, my own understanding of the Bible, my relationship to the Bible, what is God like? How does the Bible fit into that? All, all those sorts of questions really came into play for me. And so let's let's talk about those assumptions and their importance. And, you know, one of them, I mean, let's just say what they are, because I have them written down in front of me. So, um, yeah, the, the, the Bible is fundamentally cryptic. It's, its meaning is not obvious. That's an ancient assumption. Another is that the book uh, of the Bible is like a um, lessons that are relevant for us today, whenever that today is. And there also, there are no contradictions or mistakes in the Bible. And then the fourth one is that the Bible is somehow divinely given. It's, it's something that is from God in some sense. And those are four assumptions that just come out again and again reading ancient literature, Jewish or Christian literature, and then sort of had a profound impact. So I thought we could talk about each of those and maybe just sort of play them off of uh, modern assumptions about reading the Bible, which can sometimes like run into some conflicts and tensions with ancient ways of thinking. How does that sound? Uh, it sounds great. <laughs> I, I would uh, I, I would say I, I didn't start out with this list of four assumptions. I my original interest was just uh, trying to understand the way people in the second or third century BC and going on into the first century of the ADs, uh, how these people understood biblical texts. And I had a, a nice wide variety of people to read. There were, uh, to begin with, a bunch of Jewish interpreters who wrote books like the Book of Jubilees, which nobody's ever heard of, but was a very important book in, uh, uh, say, the second century uh, before the Common Era. And then um, individuals whose name we know, we don't know who wrote the Book of Jubilees, but we know somebody named Ben Sira, who uh, uh, lived again in the second century. And then um, other figures who wrote in Greek, uh, Philo of Alexandria and Josephus, they all had written about biblical texts, and they have very different styles. Philo is a, an amazing Greek-speaking, Greek-writing uh, rhetorician, among other things. Josephus, uh, you know, is <laughs> less great, but, uh, but it, we also have his writings. And then we have lots of anonymous rabbinic writings, from those same centuries. But what surprised me was that they all seem to subscribe to that list of four assumptions that you just named, uh, or rather putting it through my own experience. The more I read these people, the more, and, and no matter how different they were in their lives and their interests and so forth, but they all seem to uh, assume the same four things about uh, any biblical text or the proto-biblical text. 
they assume that uh, that uh, you know a biblical text could be and and usually was somehow cryptic people you know had to uh, read between the lines to understand w- what it meant and this of course is a kind of counterintuitive way of reading normally when we read something we think it's pretty straightforward it's telling what it wants to say but with biblical texts it often happened that people said well it says x but what it really means is y Mm-hmm. And so you have to kind of look deeply into its words to understand what's not being said. And the second thing that you mentioned uh, is um, is that uh, <clears throat> these these texts are writing about the Bible, and so the people who are writing about it, even before there was a fixed canon, there was there was you know something like the Bible was around, and um, p- people. Uh, assumed that they were what they had to say was somehow relevant to me where you know wherever the writer of these interpretations was now, that wouldn't be a, a, a normal assumption that you bring to any other text you know if you're reading the uh, laws of Hammurabi you might say well that's interesting if you're a you know professor you might even say oh, I could write an article about this <laughs> but uh, basically that was then, this is now, and so why should I think about um, obeying those laws? But of course, in biblical texts, people do assume if there are laws that, you know, some of them have to be obeyed today. Indeed, this is the word of God. So in that respect, it is also kind of a counterintuitive assumption. The third, likewise, to think that the Bible is perfect, that there are no contradictions, there are, you know, uh, no, of course, factual errors. This isn't what you would necessarily bring to the reading of uh, any other text, but that's what these ancient interpreters assumed. And uh, you rightly mentioned the the fourth assumption, that these, these books come from God or somehow uh, were transmitted with God's intention that we uh, read them. That's fourth because, not because it's fourth in importance, but it's the one that um, makes itself explicit rather after than the first three. The first three yeah. got said very often in the second century or third century, and this only a little bit later and, and less consistently. Is, is there a, when I think about this list, it seems like the seem to uh, dovetail off of that last one, meaning there's assumptions about what we can expect from a book if it comes from God. So if it comes from God, it's cryptic, it's relevant for today, there's no contradictions. So those all kind of flow from that one. Would that be fair? Uh, well, that's what, I, you know, a lot of people uh, assume, but it, it's it's striking that it isn't true. You, you, you know, people uh, often in the first or second century say, Moses wrote that, da, 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 and it, there's no um, enabling legislation to say that everything that Moses wrote came from God. Uh, the book of Genesis didn't seem to have an author. And so, you know, I'm just going to say that this is what it says in Genesis, and here's how I understand it. Yeah. Um, can we get back to the cryptic notion? Because I think, you know, three of those assumptions – will make a lot of sense for, you know, I'm thinking of particular people of faith, you know, like today, like, yeah, it's from God. Yeah, I guess the Bible really wouldn't contradict itself. And yet, it's relevant for today. But it's that first one, that the Bible is fundamentally cryptic, um, which is absolutely there. That's part of the ancient mentality. But can, can you flesh out a little bit more, like, where does that assumption, why have an assumption like that? Well, uh, one reason would be that taking the text at its word would often end the interpreters in a place that was very uncomfortable for them. In the meantime, you know, the time when when uh, these texts were first written down and the now of the interpreter, all sorts of things that one wanted to believe about the Bible didn't seem to be consistent with what the words were saying. Mm-hmm. Moral standards and all, you know, all sorts of things um, were just different. So it was important to say, even though it seems to be saying this, uh, what it really means is that. I think this was probably important for all 
ancient interpreters, but certainly after uh, uh, Jewish and Christian streams began to separate, it might have been a little easier to be a Christian. And, you, you know, you could you would say, well, those laws have been superseded, but Jews didn't have that liberty. So for them, and, and uh, at a somewhat later period, uh, when they were split off from Christianity. But for, for them, it was a- absolutely crucial. Well, it seems connected, again, to the other ones in the sense that if it's going to be relevant for today, X can't always mean X because X might be irrelevant. You're so right. X needs to mean Y so that I can make it mean something for me today. And the same with contradictions. Well, if I find a contradiction, what do I do with that? Well, I've already kind of a priori assumed it can't have that. So if it's cryptic, I I get a way around that one as well. So it, it kind of is, the cryptic one is a, a justification maybe for the others as well. So the, I'm seeing a lot of connections between all four of these. Right. No, you're, you're quite right. And I, I would say the cryptic assumption is for all interpreters a kind of starting point. You don't assume that uh, these texts are not exactly what they seem to be then you're going to have trouble with uh, all the rest. So how does that how does that square because I think that you know we're talking about ancient interpreters and then we get to the modern era where you know I, in my tradition it would have grown up with things like well it's not really cryptic we have a plain reading we just have to look at the grammatical historical context and we can come up with some uh, what it meant back then. So there seems to be in, in the modern period a move to not what does it mean for me today, but what does what did it mean back then? And then somehow we try to figure out how it means something for us today. But how does that, you know, because I, I was just thinking in my tradition, these would all still be relevant. Like these would all still be kind of the forefront of what we would have been taught. But then we have this other thing, which is context, historical criticism. And we're trying to, it feels like we're in a cultural moment. We're trying to mix those two together. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I, I certainly second that observation. I, but I think the big, you have to really regard this whole subject uh, historically as well. This way of reading, you know, it was amazing. Once it took hold, it was very, very difficult to throw any of this stuff into question precisely because everybody knew that texts were cryptic and they were talking to us and and so forth. So people, uh, once they had ascribed to this way of reading, um, it just uh, kind of ballooned. Uh, in the early Christian centuries, the uh, Christian, you know, the very first Christians were Jews, but then these ways parted and um, and uh, Christians uh, uh, developed a, a, a eventually a rather complicated fourfold reading of Scripture. They said that, at least potentially, there weren't too many good examples of this, but at least potentially a particular uh, verse or even a word could have four different meanings in the sacred text. This is quite separate from our four assumptions, but there was the historical or literal meaning, and that was, um, I I have to say, the least interesting of all the ones that you were um, uh, taught. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was the allegorical, the anagogical, and I don't want to get into these uh, categories, but this was, uh, you know, this meant that if you wanted to read the Bible, well, you weren't going to. You needed to go to an expert like me <laughs> to, make any, uh, to make any sense of this. In fact, if we're speaking in real terms, m- most Christians uh, couldn't read. Uh, why, why would you, you know, want to know how to read? There were these, you know, people who would explain it to you well into the Middle Ages. You know, uh, uh, there were... Uh, adept explainers who preached in church or sometimes on the village green, um, and they um, uh, they uh, would tell you exactly what it meant. And it was, you know, the more complicated, the more uh, it seemed that uh, you simply uh, had to trust uh, the, uh, uh, the respected ancient teachings that had been written down, as well as the uh, present, you know, medieval or whoever, exponents of those teachings. Yeah. I mean, it seems like those, that fourfold, so-called fourfold method, um, 
it, it's not the same as the four assumptions, but they sort of map onto each other a little bit because, yeah, there is that historical literal meaning, but so what? I mean, that's that's not the one that has meaning for you. And, you know, the allegorical meaning, which I think, I mean, if I'm right about this, I think that largely became a Christological meaning, like talking about Jesus somehow, and then a moral meaning, like, you know, okay, what do I do? And then sort of more future-oriented, where is all this going at the end of the day, you know, the eschaton and things like that. And it seems like that's still – that's very ancient because it's all about how does this ancient text continue speaking to us and the way to do it is to interpret it in these various kinds of ways because the original doesn't help us very much. Right. Right. So you have to do something. And, and, you know, that's, that's, to me, that's, that's, that's liberating and absolutely fascinating and, and rather obvious once you start <laughs> thinking about it a bit, because this book, what's it doing there? It, it has to be brought into your presence somehow. Well, it's all, it's all true. I think the thing that was um, uh, kind of crucial was the point at which uh, it all came to an end. And it wasn't exactly a point, but as, uh, as time went on, people, um, came to uh, question whether this great apparatus of ancient biblical interpretation wasn't just, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, would lead people astray to take uh, um, what's, uh, you know, maybe a premier example. Uh, Christians for centuries believed that Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac on an altar uh, because that's what God had demanded, that this was actually a kind of foreshadowing, foretelling of the story of the crucifixion, in which God was willing to sacrifice his only son. Uh, and, you know, th- there were things like that that were absolutely central to uh, Christian faith until starting in, you know, that vague period called the Renaissance, but say starting in the 14th, 15th century, people uh, began to wonder, is this really what these, uh, what that, maybe it's just something that happened to this old guy, Abraham, that God told (laughs) him to sacrifice his son, put him to the test, but had nothing to do with the events of the New Testament. Um, Yeah. People were kind of reluctant. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, not to get into the weeds too much here, but what, like, what was even prompting that, that desire to sort of, well, let's, it's almost like a modern thing, like what actually happened or what, what, what's going on back then, this, this move back to original meaning and things like that. I mean, what might have, what might have prompted people to do that? Or is that just too difficult a question to answer? Because we're living in that now, right? P- modern people of faith, we're, we're heirs to this tradition of saying, yeah, ancient schmancient, we have, we have these other kinds of questions that come up. And I think it would help people to understand something about how we got to where we are, you know, and, and like, what are some of those modern assumptions, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, I think before getting even to, to modern assumptions, one has to get to, the, you know, the, the events that ushered this new way of thinking in. And uh, certainly one of them was the, the humble fact that a printing press was invented. And suddenly you could get a printed Bible, not exactly like the one you have on your bookshelf now, but something that was mass produced and, and that could be uh, read by anyone who knew how to read. And some of those people were people who uh, uh, were, wanted to learn Hebrew so that they could read the Hebrew Bible in the original. And the teachers weren't reluctant to step forward. There were a lot of uh, early grammars of uh, the Hebrew language, uh, of vocabularies of, the, uh, of Hebrew texts. And uh, so it was what a thrill to pick up the, the Bible. I, I suspect it's still a thrill and suddenly be able to read the words and understand what they're saying. But that thrill was uh, rather quickly or uh, over a long period of time uh, came, came to have a downside because up until then, if we're speaking about Western Europe, 
people really uh, uh, read the Bible in Latin. It wasn't uncommon for scholars to know Latin, but now they could read uh, the Bible in Hebrew and compare it to Jerome's Vulgate, that great um, uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible into Latin. And at first, it just you know, it was hard to figure out, but somehow Jerome says this, but the Hebrew words say that. Not a whole lot of big differences, but enough to say this translation was done by a human being. And then uh, within a, the next century, people began to say, you know, Jerome was wrong. This mm -hmm. is not the right translation. And after that, uh, there developed actually beginning a little before then, uh, people began translating a Hebrew uh, or Greek into you know European languages, French, Italian, English, and and so that uh, uh, opened a whole kind of new vista. Here, here's where we're the uh, common people. If they if, if they knew how to read, they could read exactly what the Hebrew text was saying, rather than reading uh, Jerome's translation. Mm -hmm. So it's paying attention to the text and. Um, in, in the original language, that really began to get people thinking about, well, may, maybe the past should be questioned a little bit. Is right. that fair? Yeah. And that sort of has snowballed, I guess, into the, you know, the modern periods. Hey, everybody. It's Dorsey Marshall from Southern New Jersey. I'm feeling pretty good about things right now. I just got my miracle spring water from that guy on TV. Not sure if I was supposed to drink it or sprinkle it, so I did both. Now I'm just sitting back waiting for heaven to pour out the blessing that'll solve all my problems. You may be asking, how can I become a person of such great faith as you? Well, I don't really know. But I do know that by going to patreon.com slash the Bible for normal people, you can support this podcast for as little as a dollar a month and help us bring you some of the most important content you will ever need in your life. Consider joining me in the producers group, where you can engage in exclusive discussions with Pete and Jared on the direction of the podcast and how to make it better. Now, I'm not going to promise that your seed faith gift will protect you from COVID-19 or even keep you out of hell. But hey, what have you got to lose? Now, I'd like to thank a few of our producers, Mike Cook, Kara Mosley, Philip Gibson, Patty Brown, Steve Sutton, Dave Oakley, Brenda Elzer, and Cheryl Kopick. Thanks for your support and for making this endeavor all that it can be. Now back to the podcast. So, um, can you talk a little bit about the Protestant Reformation in the context? Well, exactly. Of that was the next thing. I was okay, good. Uh, we're tracking as usual. Go ahead. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, another place where the rubber hit the road, so to speak, was the Protestant Reformation because it wasn't a, a very peaceful Reformation. There were more than angry words on both sides. And the Protestants uh, said, well, you know, uh, you're asking us to obey the authority of the Pope in Rome, but, you know, why should we do that? Uh, he already is famous for having, um, you know, made mistakes. And, uh, and so we want to just have an unmediated look at the Word of God without listening to what the Pope has to say. This was a great way of not only promoting modern biblical scholarship and, and, and uh, destroying uh, those four assumptions, but also, uh, and more relevantly, it was what um, uh, could seriously undermine the authority of the Catholic Church. That was the, uh, number one on the program of, um, you know, those early reformers. So you said something interesting there. You said modern biblical scholarship and destroying these four assumptions. So not to bring us too forward too fast, but what is what would be your opinion on the relationship between a historical critical uh, study of the Bible and modern biblical scholarship and these four assumptions? Is it tenable to say, given all the insights we've had from biblical scholarship over the last two hundred years? that we can still reasonably hold to these four assumptions? Do they, do they need to shift in order for us to hold those as compatible things? I'm curious, because it, it seems like f this was, you know, the modern Reformation 500 years ago, but it seems like a lot of uh, Christians would still hold to these four assumptions, but also want to have modern biblical, criti you know, critical scholarship as well. Yeah, historical consciousness, things like that. 
Right. All this came along, but I think uh, one has to say that what really uh, was weakened was that first oh so powerful assumption uh, that the text was cryptic, that it, it didn't necessarily mean what it said. Reform congregations were certainly happy to hold on to the other three, but uh, were reluctant to, uh, to uh, say, well, this text says X, but it means Y. Uh, if that opened the, um, the door to any assumption that anybody wanted to assume. It doesn't say this, but uh, our church believes in this, that, or the other. That really made it a very questionable assumption. And people uh, started off with the great freedom of applying it, and then little by little uh, began to back away from it because it, it left people without uh, any... Uh, uh, any way of uh, establishing limits. Yeah, I mean, not, not to put too fine a point on it, but there's a there seems to be a naivete uh, in thinking that, well, if I just have the Hebrew in front of me, I can get back to what the authors originally thought, and this is how I sort of live my life. These are the lessons that I take. But that opens you up to the very thing that I guess these ancient interpreters were either intuiting or dealing with directly that this ancient text begins to become somewhat irrelevant. And the way to, I mean, this is maybe a little simplistic, but the way to help make it relevant is to see the meaning beneath the meaning, to make it cryptic. And I, I guess, you know, Jared, the way we were raised and, and many of our listeners were raised, that the notion that you can have those three other assumptions, you know, the, the Bible is relevant for us, there are no contradictions, it's from God, and matching that with not the first assumption, the Bible's cryptic, but because the Bible's the Word of God, it's plain as day. And, right. And that's the, I mean, that's, that's, that creates certain tensions because that's almost the pathology, again, that's a really strong word, but I don't care. I'm in recovery. I'm fine. That's, you know, that's the, the, um, the, the pathology of thinking that you can have this Bible that's so deeply and inextricably bound to our traditions. You can have this Bible, but you can get there through historical analysis. You can get there by removing the crypticness of it and just getting to the plain sense. And it seems to me that's that's something that I really picked up from reading again recently. How to read the Bible, and that it just it's, that's a very meaningful paradox, I think, for 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 a lot of people who who you know choose to engage it. That the the modern way is not going to get you to that place of let's say intimacy with the text and with God. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I not only makes sense, it's, a, it's a, I think, a, a very important point uh, to make. Yeah. And uh, w one thing that, um, uh, you know, while I uh, second that emotion, as Smokey Robinson <laughs> didn't say, uh, I, I, would, <clears throat> I, would, I would say it, it, it was a kind of two-edged sword that um, it seemed like this was going to be a great uh, tool was going to get us to, you know, the real Bible. Actually, I didn't make up that uh, phrase. It was, uh, uh, you know, a late 19th and early 20th century um, biblical scholar, professor, who um, said, if you really, you know, think about it, what we uh, um, Protestant scholars are doing, because modern biblical scholarship, I have to say, was from beginning almost to, to the middle of the 20th century, uh, a, a Protestant endeavor just to, you know, read, uh, read, read the Bible without any of these old traditions that had been around for centuries, and those poor Catholics were still, uh, you know, uh, reading uh, this into the text. Um, uh, but uh, we're just going to let uh, uh, let the facts speak for themselves. And in a sense, we're all archaeologists. We're mm -hmm. digging down into the ground in order to find the real Bible, the Bible before a lot of the stuff that uh, I would regard as nonsense. Uh, a lot uh, uh, of those things um, uh, were identified as such. 
uh, you know, I, I'm, go I'm going to just simply dig down until I've restored the real Bible, the words that were spoken from God to the prophet's ear. And uh, the, it's, uh, I guess, somewhat surprising nowadays uh, for scholars to look back and say, well, it was only a little more than 100 years ago that someone <laughs> could talk about um, uh, excavating the real Bible from the incrustations of, uh, uh, you know, Midrashic inter uh, Jewish interpretation and early Christian interpretation, and then all sorts of other things that were added. Get down to the real text. As this um, uh, goal was pursued over the last century, um, what we found out was that wasn't mm, such a... Uh, uh, an easy en endeavor. It, uh, uh, what it would lead to would be time and time again, not the real Bible at all, but uh, something that had um, meant something entirely different in its original historical context, something that, you know, was not enhancing of our faith, but uh, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, in dismantling, so to speak, those assumptions, I, I guess, again, this is something, I'm, I'm just channeling things that you said, but um, it's it's those ancient interpretive assumptions that actually made the Bible. Yes. Right. Talk about that a little bit. Just explain what I just said to the people who are <laughs> listening. So, <laughs> Well, you have to go back again to the second or first century to some guy with a long beard who's a sage, and uh, he is um, going to explicate something that's, you know, rather trumbling in, in the text. I might take an example. I mean, uh, I, I'm yes, always full of examples, but this one I think, Pete, you, you might connect to uh, uh, because uh, – uh, one of one of the you know little geographical uh, complications uh, it starts in the book of Exodus. Actually, I remember it's chapter sixteen, where um, the Israelites who've just been freed from Egyptian bondage are uh, you know off wandering around in the desert, and there's no water to drink. And Moses strikes the rock, and water comes flowing out of uh, uh, out of the rock, and uh, and uh, that's enough to feed this huge army of uh, and a crowd of of uh, recently um, liberated Israelites. If you flash forward uh, forty years, they're still in the desert, though coming to the end of their um, wanderings in the wilderness, and the same thing happens. There's no no water to drink, and uh, Moses and Aaron go to the uh, strike a rock, and and the water comes out, and um, you know th this was hard to reconcile. What, 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, ro rocks aren't usually full of water, and what what is all this about? And of course, the ancient interpreters had a um, uh, an answer to that question. Uh, uh, Strange as it may seem, it wasn't two different rocks, but the same rock that followed the Israelites during their 40 wanderings uh, in, the, in the desert. And um, the striking of the rock was, you know, a, uh, simply a way of accessing this divinely sent um, source of water that had followed them all those 40 years. After all, why only at the beginning, at the end, did they fall short of water? Mm -hmm. um, did that have any afterlife in Christianity, that interpretation? You're asking me? Uh, you, yeah, because you taught me this, and I remember the sitting in class when you said this, and I said, I've got some thinking to do, but, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 refers to the rock that followed them was Christ. He has this rather convoluted typology between the Red Sea and the desert experience and tying it to Jesus, and, and um, he's certainly taking that story and creatively applying it to a very different time and place and circumstance. And so, tying, you know, Christ to the rock that followed. He doesn't just say the rock back then was Christ. He says the rock that followed them was Christ. So, you've got right. this rock at the beginning and end of the 40-year wilderness period that is actually some sort of mobile source of water. 
Which makes sense, right? Because, I mean, the food is there. It's given every day, except for sun, except for Saturday, right? So it's given every day, but there's no indication of where the water came from. So it must have followed them around like a portable water fountain or something. So That's great, yeah. But Paul's just a part of that. And I, I've, that's the thing that I've talked about in other contexts that really, that made my eyes just open up that Paul's Jewish, and he's part of Jewish tradition, and he's thinking about this like a Jew, and and he's just sort of almost um, a, an unconscious conduit to these interpretive traditions that are rooted in these assumptions that we're talking about. Like, this has to be relevant for our moment now. Who cares about a water source in Exodus and Numbers? Doesn't, Doesn't matter. Right. It has to mean something now, and so by golly, Paul did it. And, you know, to... I guess if we're going to adopt those modern assumptions, we have to say that what Paul is saying, well, that's nice, but it's not what the text says. So, Paul's taking the text out of context. And that is a place where Jared and I can both attest, you run into some trouble with Protestants because Paul can't be doing that because there's nothing cryptic here, right? There's there's nothing right. going on like that. So, you just have to – sort of somehow justify exegetically that Paul is actually getting this explicitly from something in the Old Testament, which is an act of Midrashic interpretation, which is a further irony that, you know, you have to use Midrashic interpretation to defend the plain meaning of the Bible, which has always sort of bothered me a little bit. But anyway, yeah, I just, see, that's the thing with, with Christianity, that's, we're, we're in the same boat. You know, this is, we're no different. Our, our tradition owes its existence to these kinds of transformations of these ancient stories, not unlike Judaism. Right. So, is, is one of the challenges then, what you're saying is, what we've deemed in our modern period to be, quote-unquote, the right way to interpret a text doesn't square with how we see the text interpreting itself. Is that kind of what you're saying, Pete, too, about Paul? We want Paul to be a good modern biblical scholar, mm -hmm. and Paul is not. Paul right. is an ancient interpreter. At least a medieval Protestant. Right. <laughs> he's not even pulling that off, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's a problem for us, yeah. right? What does it if, mean? If, you, if he's Protestant, at least then conservatives can say, we don't care about historical criticism because this is just a normal part of the Protestant tradition. But even – that's even a move towards historical criticism, the Protestant the, – the Reformation era where you – what what's the original meaning? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you say that, right, Jim, that's – you're off and running in a, in a direction that is paradoxically not supportive of the tradition itself that brought you to a point where you can talk about the tradition 1,500 years later. That's a nice convoluted way of saying it, but, you know. No, I think uh, – I hope people got it. Yeah, <laughs> so do I. My students don't, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I I would just add that it, you know among those uh, first century ancient biblical interpreters is Jesus of Nazareth. He we can read what uh, what it says in the New Testament, and then um, well, uh, if, if you have a copy of any number of compendia of ancient biblical interpretations that start uh, with Genesis, you'll find, oh, I see, he's reading this verse as if it's saying that. Well, that's just what ancient interpreters do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in a sense, uh, in a different world, people would have uh, said, wow, uh, how great of our Jewish brethren to show us how texts were read uh, uh, and not only by people, but by Jesus. And, uh, and yet that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my. So, okay, uh, here, here's the big question, you know, as we're sort of winding down here a little bit. And um, how, how, to, how to live with the tension? I don't want to say solve the tension. Because right. I don't think this is a tension that can be solved. But how to live with the tension of basically – being modern people of faith, whether Jewish or Christian, and we have this ancient text that does things that we just don't do in the modern period, and how to sort of bridge those two worlds, that's a perennial problem, but it's a very practical problem for people too. So, do you have any, do you have any thoughts on sort of how to do – do we have just left brain, right brain thing to sort of keep things separate, or is there some 
conversation between them? How, how does that how does that work? Well, I, I'll say here what I perhaps should have said uh, half an hour ago, but it, it looks very different to Jews and to Christians. Those are two mm. different, you know, readerships. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that for Jews, those assumptions never stopped. There is this, uh, you know, kind of characteristic way uh, that Jews bring these assumptions to, uh, you know, very practical details of uh, everyday life, which is what Judaism is all about. You know, you mm-hmm. have to do this when you get up in the morning, and then you have to pray and use these words and so on and so forth. So, uh, in that respect, um, uh, for Jews, the Bible is already definitively interpreted. There's no, you know, new interpretation need not uh, show, show its face. Uh, if, if it does, it's no problem because it's going to be built on earlier assumptions, mm-hmm. in fact, uh, earlier bodies of uh, explanations. I think if you're a, a Protestant, it is more problematical um, because uh, of just what you mentioned. Uh, you know, they, they can't, uh, you know, turn their backs, which Jews sometimes can without any problem, turn their backs on what we know of history and so forth. That's, that's just not relevant. For, for a modern Protestant, I think that it is. It's necessarily relevant. I, I used to be a big... Uh, a fan when I was living in Boston before I moved to Jerusalem. Um, uh, I, I used to listen to WBUR, the Boston University uh, radio station, which on Sunday mornings would have uh, usually a guest uh, a speaker uh, or sermonizer. And it was so interesting to me to, to see the way a, a, a liberal Protestant approach struggled with the particular quandary that you you mentioned and and often not successfully i noticed at a certain point that some of the invited speakers would say well instead of a scriptural reading i want to read a poem by dylan thomas <laughs> right <laughs> I, I think i uh, may be wrong but i still anyway for myself ascribe to a difference between those two sources but um <laughs> i understand the problem yeah well, we've been talking quite a bit at our time today around some of the challenges that, that you talk about in your book, How to Read the Bible. But here, as we end, do you have other projects that you're working on or books that just came out? Like, what are the questions that you're interested in now or and are putting out into the world? Well, I, uh, I suppose I should say, first of all, I've talked to many people who are not academics, and uh, they tend to assume that what a professor does is learn his stuff during four or five years in graduate school and then spends the next 40 or 50 years repeating. (laughs) But that really isn't what it means to be a a scholar. Your doctorate is really just a driver's license that you can then carry with you and, and explore new things. And what I've been thinking about a lot lately is has nothing to do with the things that we've been talking about. It has to do with, um, uh, I guess what uh, neuroscience has showed us um, about uh, the human brain and what that what light that might shed on biblical texts, and I it's hard to you know say in a few uh-huh. minutes uh, what that means, but uh, but certainly what we understand now is that um, there's such a thing as the human self. And that self is, you know, has some universal uh, characteristics. I think all human beings believe that I am the same person that was speaking 15 minutes ago or even uh, was going out with that girl 40 years ago. Um, uh, in other words, there's a kind of assumption of continuity. With, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but, um, uh, and uh, I don't think there's any reason to believe that any of that is true. But we all do believe that. But there are other things. Uh, here we go with assumptions again. There are other things that uh, uh, we assume about ourselves and our minds um, that differ very much from the way other human beings uh, elsewhere on the globe uh, assume about themselves. So, uh, in, in that respect, um, uh, this uh, our modern Western self is uh, is a rather unique creation. 
uh, I should say neuroscientists, you know, can't point to anything in the brain that seems to be the self. Uh, they were trying to figure out what that might be, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, time ago. But uh, uh, it's not in the pineal gr- uh, gland, as uh, Descartes believed, and it's not in this or that. It seems that um, uh, the self, I myself, the great um, you know, recipient of uh, sensory inputs and sorter of memories and so forth, this person inside the person doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, um, as a result, people's own ideas of what I myself am differ uh, from place to place and time to time. Well, that's all an introductory to the uh, question. What, what did people in biblical times assume about themselves and can we find evidence of it in scripture and i i think i'm certainly not the only one who's interested in this but i just think this is such an exciting question to ask uh, mm. uh, why what did somebody in the time of paul or for that matter in the time of moses um think a human being was and what sorts of things it could or could not do yeah, it's it's fascinating. I think you've just doomed yourself to being invited back on at some point to uh, to talk about that more. Yeah, on that hopeful topic that there is no self. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> that wonderful, uplifting oh, I dose of reality that we have. There's to also do freedom with. to that, right? Yeah, there is a freedom to well, that. Well, I recently read a book, an essay, which concluded with a comforting observation that the human self may not exist. But a sense of self certainly can, even if it's utterly <laughs> false. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Uh, well, thank uh, you so much, uh, Jim, for taking some time out and calling us in, you know, calling in all the way from Jerusalem to have this conversation. I think it's going to be really helpful to others. It's helpful to me. So, I really appreciate you coming on. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, it was same a pleasure. Jim. Hope to have you on again. Okay. All righty. <laughs> Folks, thanks again for listening to this episode. If you want to find out more about James Kugel, you know, it's not like he has a Twitter presence. I don't know. I don't think he does. But, you know, just just read stuff. Do it the old-fashioned way. And just a couple of books. He's written many books on biblical interpretation and the history of interpretation. But the one that started it all off for me is called Early Biblical Interpretation. And that sort of lays out the you know, ins and outs and wherefores of like ancient interpreters, if you're interested in that. And I think as, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to be Christian in all this, that's a, this is a very, very relevant thing to look at. And also, you know, um, another book that came out, out 10 years ago or so is called How to Read the Bible, which is, in my opinion, the the best book. This is, you know, I'm a little biased, but I'm also right. It's the best book out there for explaining Basically, if you're interested in the history of just what modern biblical scholarship says about Isaiah or about uh, the Pentateuch or about Daniel, about anything, that this explains it all and in a way that's not remotely dry. So you have that. Then on top of that, layering it with that, the whole issue of like, well, how, but how do ancient interpreters handle these texts too? And then he has these sections where he talks about navigating this, these issues, sort of the stuff we talked about today. So I really can't recommend that book enough. Yes, yeah, so please do check those books out. And as always, before we go, we want to give a shout out to our team, without whom we couldn't be putting on this podcast at all. So thanks to Megan Kamek, our producer, Reed Lively, Marketing Administration, Dave Gerhardt, our audio engineer, Tessa Stoltz, our creative director, and Stephanie Spate, who tirelessly transcribes these podcasts for us each week. Thank you so much. And Marmalade, my cat. Yes, of course. Who is just always I'm there. sorry. I'm so sorry, Marmalade, I know. to forget Marmalade, you. Yeah, okay. Sure. I will be watching my... She'll come pee on your house I'll make later. sure I lock my doors now. Yeah, please do that. Yeah, she'll kill you. <laughs> All right. See you later. Hey, everyone. Just a quick note so you aren't blindsided in a few weeks. This podcast has been ad-free for our first four seasons, and we're so grateful for everyone's support. However... For us to stay sustainable and continue to bring our best, we have invited some ad partners onto the podcast, and we'll be rolling that out in the coming weeks. For all of our Patreon supporters, you'll be getting the podcast ad-free, same as always. For everyone, we are so grateful that you continue to listen, and we hope to bring you the best in biblical scholarship for years to come.